Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Wow. First line of the intro and I've already forgotten where to go next. This is going well. Um, Welcome to any new viewers who have showed up here. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here and welcome back returning viewers. Thanks for following along with this thing that I do. This is a Crafty Type podcast coming to you from the Northwest Hills of Connecticut, and you can find me at all the fun places as Freakish Lemon, like Twitter, Tumblr, if it doesn't explode, Instagram, and Ravelry. Um, my brain half formed a thought there, but Tumblr's kind of a nightmare. Uh, but if you do follow me on Tumblr, you already know where you can find me if Tumblr suddenly decides to just delete me. Um, you can find show notes for this episode and all episodes at freakishlemon.com. No. Freakishlemon.com or freakishlemonpodcast.com. They go to the same place. You can also find transcripts there and this episode is closed captioned if you need it. Um, we have a group on Ravelry. Just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. You'll find us. Freakish Lemon is a pretty odd phrase to be typing in, so you'll get there. Um, all the links to these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you want to follow along with what I'm doing, consider hitting that subscribe button so you know when I post a new episode. Um, filming this on Saturday, January 12th, and I rolled out of bed about an hour ago after not being able to go back to sleep after waking up at 5.30, starving. You ever wake up hungry? That was one of those kinds of mornings. But I've only had about four hours sleep, so this is the best you're gonna get out of me today. And if you, you don't get a podcast today, then you're not getting a podcast in January. It's just not gonna happen. So that is that. I don't know why finger guns were necessary, but the thing. So I have a bullet point under podcast stuff. Um, and I wanted to briefly mention this here as a challenge to myself. I've not caught up with other podcasters, so I don't know if any white podcasters have mentioned this aloud yet. Um, but it's so much easier to write this than to talk about it. So as a, as a challenge to myself, I'm talking about it now. Um, over the past couple of days, there's been some pretty intense discussion on Instagram in the fiber community about uh, racism in the fiber community. Um, and I think that's been a long time coming. And uh, if you're interested in finding more, and you should be, uh, I would recommend checking out the hashtag diversity. Uh, if I remember, I will spell it here, but it's in the show notes if I don't remember. Um, or if you go over to my feed on Instagram, I do have a post. It's just, the image is just an image of the word hashtag diversity. Um, and there's more there. There's uh, accounts to get started in learning what sparked this and, and why it needs to be addressed by white people. Um, but I mean, uh, I'm not going to talk about it a hell, whole heck of a lot, but the bottom line is um, that white designers, white dyers, white makers are more welcome because of societal racism. And we, as white folks, need to do better to unlearn the biases that make that the case. Um, we need to support the groups that are harmed by our language and the way our choices are shaped because of a long, I mean, they're all shaped by a long history of oppression and genocide. That is a fact. Um, buy yarn from dyers of color, you know, look, look for it. Uh, <laughs> buy patterns, buy designers of color, look for them. They're there. Um, 
promote and share the amazing work done by makers of color in our community. They're there. We need to welcome them. Um, that That's it. We have to do the work. It's not on them. It's on us. <laughs> uh, and I want to encourage the white folks watching this um, to take the first step and take a minute to think about why we feel guilty or angry or scared whenever the topic of racism comes up in conversation. It, that's the first step. You gotta figure out why you're feeling that way. Because if you don't know why you're feeling that way, you're not gonna be able to stop it or calm yourself down or any of that. So that's it. We gotta put in the work. Um, thanks for listening to my TED talk. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to get that up front while it's fresh in my mind. It's kind of been happening over the past two or three days that I've seen. Um, and I don't really check my Instagram all that much during the week, so I'm catching up, but it's a thing that, yep, we gotta be better. That's it. It's a lot of work. We're gonna make mistakes. We gotta apologize when we do make mistakes, but we gotta do the work. Done. End of discussion. Let's move on to some crafty stuff. Um, even that little bit feels heavy to say aloud. And that ain't right. So, <laughs> so let's do some finished objects because crafting is the thing that we all do. Um, I have a bunch of them because it's been a month. Um, I have some knitting finished. I have some hand, I have a hand knitting finished object. Huzzah. And they're a little grungy because usually, oh, I'm out of focus. Usually I wait until after the podcast to start wearing things, but, um, this winter's been unseasonably warm, and this week the weather decided, now it's January for real. So I was wearing these socks for the past three days, which is why they're a little bit starting to show some wear. Um, but these are my Palmer ribbed socks, which is what I'm calling them. Um, it's an improv pattern, but it's one that I'm kind of establishing for myself to use specifically with this yarn. This yarn is from the Palmer Family Farm here in Connecticut. I think they're out in... around Vernon somewhere. Um, they have CVM sheep. Uh, I think they're the only farm in Connecticut that has sh CVM sheep. Um, and I love buying from them, and I want to make a pair of socks out of their yarn every year that I can. So um, I'm going through the, my stash of Palmer Family Farm uh, CVM yarn and making myself some ribbed socks. So these were knit using a US 3, 3.25 millimeter Cubics needle, because I love Cubics needles and I love this yarn and all my favorite things are happening with it. Um, so I finished a pair. This is some yarn that I've had for ages, probably close to five years now. This I bought, I think, two years ago, two or three years ago. It's hard to tell because I tend to buy from them every year at the Coventry Farmer's Market. But here we go, finished a pair of socks. And uh, this yarn is not a fingering weight yarn, it's somewhere around a sport or DK weight. Um, Cause I'm pretty sure she hand spins these particular skeins that I have. They're not evenly spun. So it's kind of like, you can tell this toe, these toe, both of these toes actually are a little bit thin. You can see the, the sock blocker through them. I think I'm gonna reinforce those with some scrap yarn, but um, yeah, it's lovely lovely yarn 
and I love socks made out of this. And I specifically have been working on a ribbed pattern because the previous pair of socks that I made out of this yarn um, falls down my leg a lot. Um, I think I also had too many stitches because I was just winging it. Um, but a ribbed sock is always going to hug a little bit better than a stockinette sock. Um, and I want to wear these until the end of time. So huzzah for that. Finished object. Chuck it back there. It's stuck in my hand. Okay. Uh, and then two machine knit projects out of the same yarn. Because <laughs> I got excited about using lace weight yarn. Um, the first is my lace weight poncho. Um, that's the line where I changed um, skeins. That's the word I'm looking for. You saw this mostly, well, you saw a rectangle, I think, last episode. Um, this is a really easy poncho recipe, I guess. This is by Bren Boone, who is, oh, show notes are asleep, Snurb Yarn on Instagram, who is a fantastic maker, and you should follow her. Her spinning is just like angels singing okay so <laughs> she shared a poncho schematic on a Facebook group and I've used the measurements from that schematic to work out my cast on and how many rows and all that based on a swatch from my knitting machine this was made on my KH836E brother knitting machine which is a standard gauge machine I used a uh, dial size 6 for the lace weight. Um, it's, let's see, can I hold this up? It's a little bit see-through, but I think it's a good gauge for something like this that is always going to be worn over another garment. Um, anything else? Leading Men Fiber Arts, the Ghost Light Base, and the color Envy. I used two skeins of that for this. Um, so it's one rectangle for the body, another rectangle for the kind of cowl neck, and it's seamed. You can see the seam here. I actually did the seaming by hand on this one because it was 12 kinds of pain in my ass to get the edges back on the machine to do it by machine. So I was like, screw it, I'll do it by hand. Um, and yes, here is my poncho. It's a little wrinkled from being folded and put in the drawer to get it out of my way, but I have a poncho. And I finished another item in this yarn because I had three skeins of it total. Um, and I finished the second sample for my sideways triangular shawl from the for, for the machine knit shawl shapes project I'm working on. So this is worked from point to point using a series of increases and decreases, which is really a great way to get a an equilateral uh, triangular shawl out of a single skein of yarn because you work 50% to the middle and then work the rest of it out to the end. Um, same knitting machine, same settings. I just left them there after finishing the um, the poncho and I blocked this two nights ago. So I finished it around Christmas, but just got around to blocking it. It's got really long arms. I could have blocked the triangle deeper, but it was in my craft room and I wanted to be able to get around it. But it's a lovely yarn. I think this kind of stockinette shows off the colors really well. And I'm excited that this shawl shapes project is actually resulting in shawls that I like. That's very exciting. Um, now I just got to write all this stuff up. I've got one more shawl pattern that I want to try. I have the yarn for one sample, I gotta go digging for some yarn for the others. Because I 
I had two sets of yarn chosen for the last shawl shape, but one of those sets of yarn was um, the Halloween yarn from Legacy Fiber Arts that I found out I didn't frog the shawl that I had started with it. Now I don't want to. So I gotta go digging and stash. But that's very exciting. I gotta get some photos of this. Hopefully, now that it's cold, uh, the mud will freeze because our yard is a swamp and has been for months now. So hopefully I can get some photos soon. Check that back there. I have a combo weaving and sewing finished object. I finished my woven pants. These are the best thing I've ever made in my life. Okay. Hands down the best thing. So these are based on a pair of pants that I used to wear as part of a pirate renaissance fair costume that when they were too faded and too worn out to be worn as part of the costume because renaissance fair day is hard wearing on clothes, um, I retired them to basically house wear and it's too light to wear in the winter. My legs would be frozen. So I made myself I wove the fabric, my notes keep going to sleep, wove the fabric on my Ashford 24 inch loom using a 12 dent heddle or 12.5 dent heddle, I don't know, minimal difference. Um, this is all wool or wool blended yarns, uh, mostly grays and blacks and this pop of bright yellow, which is um, the Freakish Lemon colorway by Andy of Andre Sunitz. So I wove the yardage, I cut out my pattern pieces that I drafted from my previous pair of pants um, to reinforce the fabric before cutting. What I did was I based it around with a bright colored yarn um, around the pattern pieces and then I sewed two lines of straight stitching on the interior of the piece that I was going to be cutting out so that it wouldn't fray after I cut it. Um, so there was four leg pieces and four pocket pieces. This thing does have pockets. I copied a pocket pattern from the five out of four patterns pajama pants that I've made before um, just to get the shape of the pocket and I didn't bother weaving in any of <laughs> or snipping any of the ends from the fabric I was just so excited that I sewed together sewed together my woolen pirate pants um, there's elastic in the waistband and also gathered down the full length of the leg to um, this size. I don't know. I measured it on my leg. I didn't like take an actual measurement. I just cut a piece of elastic that would go around my leg. Um, and I love these. I love them. I cannot wear them as pajamas. I did when I first finished them but um, the fabric is so heavy that if I move suddenly in my sleep, it tears the stitching. Um, it doesn't damage the fabric in any way, but the thread just won't hold if there's too much pressure put on it, like anything else, but because this fabric is both a loose weave, a looser weave than a commercial fabric, and also a heavy fabric that's that's not going to give, um, then the thread snaps <laughs> and I have to re-sew it. So it's just for wearing around the house um, and in the backyard when I take the dog out. I love them. I love them so much. Not great against wind, however. Um, <laughs> wind blows right through them. So if I'm wearing them outside in the winter and it's windy, I gotta wear a layer underneath. But in the house, they're the best thing. The best thing ever. And I love them. And then I have sewing finished objects. 
you can see behind me here this is a Christmas shirt I sewed this um, ahead of this Christmas fabric that I got on Black Friday weekend at Joann's because it was on sale and it was the end of a bolt so I got a discount um, I used the McCall's M6044 pattern using the size large um, I'm glad I made it the Christmas shirt uh, first because this works as a great muslin and the size large is a little too large for me the shoulders are a little big not a whole lot if the rest of the shirt fit fine then I wouldn't even worry about it but the back is too large and it's too long <clears throat> a little bit it catches weird on the tops of my jeans or whatever I'm wearing underneath it um, but the collar and the cuffs fit me very well so um, I'll talk about it more in works in progress but I'm doing another one with adjustments to see if I can get a better fit out of that pattern but you know for a Christmas shirt that I'm gonna wear two or three times a year it's not bad I wore it to church <laughs> it was nice enough for church I only go to church on Christmas and sometimes Easter <laughs> um, and I sewed a tank top I was organizing my fabric um, and I had weird leftover bits of both the striped fabric and the Star Wars fabric but I figured out that I had enough if I pieced the back um, and kind of mismatched the fabrics to make a tank top this is the Lago tank top by itch to stitch I've made two of these in a plain gray um, I do have to do something about this neckline because I'm using the original neckline piece but I raised the neckline by like two inches so if anybody knows the best way to short how to figure out how to shorten that easily let me know uh, so that I can try it on the next tank top I make because I'm sure I'll make more I have a whole nother gray um, jersey worn out bed sheet that I can play with but I had enough to do this tank top um, it does fit a little bit weird here at the underarm because of the piece of Star Wars fabric I had it was about an inch too narrow for the pattern piece but I was like this is a pretty loose tank top I'm not really worried about it it does fit a little weird but maybe it'll you know when it wears out some it'll stop feeling weird but I mean this is gonna be bumming around the house or sleeping so it's not that big of a deal and then the big finished object is I finished one of the two Halloween quilts that I still had hanging around so this is let me just unfold it enough so you can see it oh yeah. It's not that big it's just cumbersome in this weird spot so this is the one with the um, sort of diamond square diamond square um, this I've been casually calling it the diamond quilt in my notes because the strips make a diamond the way the squares are pieced um, and I don't really have another name for it um yeah so I made the quilt sandwich I used this purple and orange plaid fabric for the back and I machine quilted it the top thread is a kind of navy blue thread and the back thread is black because um, that worked 
And I do like the kind of, I don't know if you'll be able to really get the color effect. It's pretty subtle. Oh, you can see a little bit of it there. I do like the navy blue on the back. The black, words are hard. Um, just because it breaks up the black a smidge and it's kind of like a night sky effect. Um, I did a different quilt pattern in each of the squares just to play around with the shapes and things. And the thing that I really like is the, oh my God, this quilt is a weird thing. Okay, in this sashing, I did this kind of faux bat motif. I don't think you can see it. But I did these like, I'm gonna draw it in the air right now. But I did kind of a, like a wing to, and then a down for, and then like a wing, and then I would curve back up around and do that again all over the place. So it's reminiscent of cartoon bat wings. Um, that was probably my favorite thing to do. And then in this border, I did the, I did kind of pointy figure eights because pointy seems more Halloween to me. I didn't do any quilting in the actual little strip border here, um, just because I felt that this, the pattern of the fabric is enough. And then I did random circly loop-de-loops um, in the final border. Sorry, my notes went to sleep and I was pushing the wrong button. So just big old circles of loop-de-loops. I did a flanged binding again because I love the flanged binding. I used the same fabric here for the actual flange. Um, and I did a better job on this flanged binding. I think there's two or three places where the thread actually ends up on the black. It's an orange thread on top, black on the bottom. But all in all, I'm pretty pleased with this. And then... There's fuzz everywhere because I have a dog. <laughs> and then I, I don't know if you can see it, where I did my initials um, December 2018 is when I finished it. Hooray! A finished quilt. Just in time for New Year's. Halloween. So I have one more Halloween quilt and a jelly roll quilt that I need to do the tops or that I need to properly quilt. Oh, I don't even know where to throw this now. I guess over there. So hooray. It's always very satisfying when the cumbersome parts of the quilt are done. They're fun parts most of the time, <laughs> but it's the most cumbersome. Piecing is my favorite bit because you can it's easy to manage it's mostly straight lines for the quilts that I'm making um but moving that quilting around is a little bit of a nightmare if you're not prepared and if you don't take enough breaks uh, and that's it for finished objects so we're going to move on to works in progress and check up on my blankets because I've been working on them. So here's my granny stripe blanket by Lucy of the Attic 24 blog. I'm using a USG 4.25 millimeter hook. I'm marling scrap yarns with some black knit picks, stroll fingering. Egg on toast is where you last saw it. So I've made some progress. Not a whole heck of a lot, but some. Um, but the magic ball is looking considerably smaller, which is exciting. So I think after this magic ball, I do have a magic ball of hand spun in here, like a little hand spun ball. Oh, there's commercial yards under the hand spun. 
I'm gonna do this one next, just so I have the actual round ones out of here, because the rest are cakes, which will be a little bit easier to manage with two strands. A little bit less tangling, I think. So that's exciting. I always say that's exciting. I don't know how exciting it is for you, but when I pull it out, I'm always a little bit excited. And like I said, this is, like I said last time, I think, it's about a third of the way done. We're nearing the halfway point, I think. It'll probably be about a twin size thing, which is thing, blanket, um, which is perfect to just like throw over the top of me as I lay out on the couch or in my dad's recliner, depending on where the dog decides that I'm gonna sit. And that's in my um, sheep and shawl um, five year anniversary tote bag. They're in South Deerfield, Massachusetts. They're a lovely little store. Their tote bag is great. And then my cozy memory blanket has been getting some love. I'm using the pattern by Georgie Nicholson. I'm using a US 1 2.25 millimeter needle. I have got fuzz all over my face. Um, I had thought I might finish my advent minis by the end of January. I can tell you right now that's not going to happen. I'm not beating myself over it. Beating myself up over it. Stop slurring your words. Hmm. Makes it really difficult to close caption um, <laughs> these episodes when I slur my words. So. Stop saying so as well. That's really annoying. The squares with progress keepers on them are new. Did those two. Did this one. Here's my needles in place for the next one. This one, this one, this one. And I think all of those were Advent minis. We're getting to the point where this arm of the blanket is stair-stepped. then I think I need to make more of an effort for this arm of the blanket because this is getting tangled on everything. And that's just in a lion brand yarn tote bag. In this project bag, which I forgot who makes this, I don't know if the tag's even in here because there's a ton of Palmer Family Farm yarn in here, is version two of the pattern. Um, just using the same numbers and making sure that it still fits. Um, using this brown Palmer Family Farm uh, CBM. Same stats from the finished pair. I have three of these skeins and I have a I have a ton of this left over. So I'm gonna have two plain brown socks. I'm gonna see what I have left after that and probably do some kind of striping or color blocking with these two, I have two of these that are like this size left um, with whatever's left of this brown. I think I'm just going to keep this little bit of scrap left over for mending because there's not a whole heck of a lot left in this, which is the more gray um, that's the heels, toes, and cuffs of the other pair of socks shove all these back into this bag. <laughs> so this bag is basically my Palmer Family Farm socks bag that I've got kind of continuously going at the moment. The knitting project I've been 
probably putting the most time in. Um, it's a little slow going just because the needles are so large and it's a little cumbersome, is my shag bark sweater. This is a pattern by Tian Foley. I'm using US 8 five millimeter needles. And this is with um, Classic Elite Yarns, Mountaintop, Blackthorn in the Wolf colorway. Um, you saw the back of the sweater. I did the little pockets. Um, so the other pockets on waist yarn, but this is the left front and I have about 18 rows to go for the left front. I'm in the final raglan decreases and that that's just there so that I could see progress. Um, because there's a bit here where you have to just do, um, work even in pattern until piece is so many inches. Um, and I like to put a progress keeper in at that point when I start work even so that I can see that progress is being made. Um, so I'm hoping this weekend to finish this left front and at least cast on the right front. And I just have two sleeves assembly and shawl collar, I think. Exciting. This sweater is going to use a lot less yarn than I thought. I might be able to get another sweater out of this yarn because I kind of just went crazy in the store, not really knowing how much I needed. Um, I bought this from Village Wools in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And when I bought it, they were having, what do they call it? Something like a bag of yarn sale, uh, where they have a bunch of clearance or a, they have a bunch of stock that needs to get cleared out in time for new stock. And, um, they basically give you a plastic bag and whatever you can fit into that bag, you get a certain percentage off. So I just filled it. <laughs> with as much yarn as I could fit in there. Like a mad person. I'm glad I did though, because Classic Elite Yarns is no longer making yarn and I love Classic Elite Yarns. And I bought all Classic Elite Yarns that day. One of those things. Um, I don't think I'll make another one of these sweaters with another shag bark with the rest of the yarn. I think I'll do a Ravelry search with the gauge I got um, and see what comes up because I never get gauge with the recommended needle size. I might as well search by my gauge rather than <laughs> the weight of yarn. <laughs> so that's that. That's in a Halloween scrap yarn or scrap fabric project bag that I made. Uh, I have been doing wheel spinning. I'm back on wheel spinning, thankfully. Um, I'm doing probably 15 minutes a, a day most days. Not every single day, but approximately averaging out 15 minutes a day. Um, while I'm kind of retraining my back muscles and abdominal muscles to actually support my spine. Um... Yes, I have about half of that big Ziploc bag left of the brown Cormo. This is really boring to look at because it's brown Cormo singles. You can imagine what that looks like. Um, but I have been also doing some drop spindling it's in this goth bag. I don't remember where I got this one from either. I'm working on a set of bats that I call the Darth Scabrous little batlings. They look like this. Darth Scabrous is from the book Red Harvest by Joe Schreiber. And it's a Star Wars horror novel about Sith zombies. <laughs> oh, Darth Scabrous, you're the worst. I finished the, where's, 
the first bobbin. I finished the first group. So they're on this bobbin. This whole bobbin is not the Darth Scabra singles. There's other yarn underneath there. Drop spindled. I just wanted to fill the bobbin. So I finished the first and I'm on the second group. Um, so here's the bobbin. You can still see some of the previous yarn sneaking through. It's an orange, orange and brown yarn. Um, I'm drop spindling this on my Turtle Made Top Whirl Drop Spindle, which is a lovely balanced spindle. Uh, I have one more group of fluffs after this that I will split evenly between the two bobbins and then I probably have to ply those because I don't think I'm going to get any more little spinning fluffs spun up onto those bobbins anytime soon. Um, the batlings are a little textured so I'm just spinning them at whatever they feel like being. Not a whole heck of a lot of thought going into that. That's kind of my I need to pace around and do something standing spinning. Um, I also have a new to me craft project bag. Nearly took a leaf off the bed. Um, at New England Fiber Festival, which is probably my favorite favorite fiber festival because it has so much stuff. There are several places for rug hooking kits and rug hooking supplies um, and other wool felt based crafts. And um, ever since Andy from Andres Units took up some rug hooking, I've been tentatively interested, but I knew that I didn't want to just buy a bunch of supplies and come up with the design myself because then I would never do it. I have so many other things that I want to do that I just would not put the time in to do it since it's new. So um, one of my goals for New England Fiber Festival this year was to find a kit. And I did find a kit. It's a kit by Loop by Loop. by And the pattern is designed by Sharon Perry. It's a simple kit. It's two black birds and a star on a rectangle. It comes with everything, um, the hook, all the wool felt, the rug hooking fabric. The only thing it doesn't come with is a frame for that. And they, they told me you can use, a, you know, any embroidery hoop, which I have. So here is how far I am in it. I'm not taking it out of the hoop because it is a pain to get this finished part cinched into the hoop because it's so thick. Um, so here it is. So probably half-ish done. Did the star first because that's real easy. Went around it with the red. Nearly done with this black bird which isn't standing out on camera as as well as it does in real daylight. Um, just kind of working each section as I can fit it into the hoop. Because this isn't a rug hooking hoop. Um, and probably I should have just used a big hoop. I also don't have a big hoop. So there's that. Um, I'm enjoying it, but this is not going to be one of my crafts going forward. I think this is a, if I see something I really, really, really like, I'll get a kit, but this isn't going to become part of my normal crafting re repertoire. <laughs> but I do, I do like how this particular piece is coming out. And that's in my gender rules are dead. Um, tote bag. 
is the word I'm looking for. Tote bag. And real quick, one last work in progress. I know I've talked about a lot of them. I look out of focus. I can't tell if I am or not, or if my screen is just dirty. Um, I've cut out the pieces. Let me start over. I'm doing another wearable muslin for the McCall's M6044 button down shirt. I use Swedish tracing paper, which is almost like an interfacing without the glue, um, to trace out the pattern pieces. What I've done is I've kept the collar pieces a size large and the cuffs a size large and the fronts and back width size large. Um, but I've done a size medium, everything else. There's some, you know, grading between the sizes. I don't know if I did a good job. We'll find out when I sew the pieces. Um, my, what I'm doing for my next wearable muslin is another holiday shirt. It's a Halloween shirt. So I figure if it doesn't fit, then I can find somebody to give it to or donate it or something. Um, and I'm really not out of the fabric. Um, the main fabric is this black, um, which I bought for quilting, but it's not great for quilting. It, it's, oops, it's a little too sheer for quilting and it shifts a lot. It's a little slippery, more slippery than other cotton fabrics I've worked with. Um, so it's a good shirt fabric, I think. Um, Cause I mean, it's not completely trans, well, that's light behind it, of course. It's not completely, you know, translucent or whatever, but um, it's not like a, a good quilting cotton that's just solid. You can see the seams You can see the, the seam allowance a little bit in a quilt when you're using this. So, so the, the fronts, the back, the under collar, um, the button bands, most of the shirt is in the black, but I have this, I have a yard of this. So what little pieces I am using are no loss if the shirt doesn't fit. So I'm going to do the collar. This, this is going to be the interior collar. This is the, or the neck band. This is the bit that goes under the button down shirt part that you can actually see. So the actual collar, one of these pieces and the cuffs are in this Halloween fabric. So no loss if the shirt doesn't fit. Um, because this isn't very much fabric and I have a yard of this. So I've cut out all my pieces. I just need to sit down and start assembling. Um, but my craft room has been a little bit of a mess. I say that every single episode. My craft room's always a mess because I'm always in there doing things. Um, but that's the next shirt I hope to finish because if this does fit with the sort of modification between the medium and large sizes, then I'm set to go for my two plaid fabrics for my 2019 make nine. And if this doesn't fit, then I'm using the other shirt pattern <laughs> for those plaid fabrics. But I need to know before I cut into those plaid fabrics because I really do like those plaid fabrics. That's it for works in progress. On to other stuff, which I'm hoping won't take up too much of your time. I've omitted the fan fiction section again. I think I'm going to omit the fan fiction section going forward because I just read so much of it. Once I start talking about it, 
I cannot stop talking about it. Although if you want to talk fanfic with me at any point, just contact me. I love fanfic. Stuff I'm watching. I am currently catching up on Vlogmas videos and podcasts. I kept up with Vlogmas for a good chunk of December, mostly because I had a week off in December. Uh, but once it came up to the, like, four or five days before Christmas, I just lost it. <laughs> I just couldn't watch any more of them. Did not find the time to do it. I'm catching up on those. I did go see Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is really good. I love Miles Morales. He's freaking great. Uh, and I also went to go see Aquaman, which was also really good. It was very weird to for my experience going to see Aquaman because I went to a different theater. I usually go to this tiny theater um, I mean, it's not the tiniest theater. It's a six screen theater, but it's in Torrington. So there's usually not a lot of people there. And I went to a theater in Waterbury, which is like a, a legitimate place where people actually go to the movies. Um, at the Apple Cinemas up there, and they have the recliners. Um, they redid the whole theater so that they have those fancy seats. So the theater fills up. It was very weird to be watching a movie with other people. I'm usually in the theater with fewer than 10 people. And this was a full theater. <laughs> it was very weird. But I suppose that's what most theaters are like. It's just weird for me because I never sit next to people in the movies unless I'm going with my family. I have a sat next to two strangers. It was very weird. Uh, stuff I'm listening to. A whole heck of a lot. Um, I've listened to the four books by Nick Offerman, all narrated by Nick Offerman. One of them, he's joined by his wife, Megan Mullally. Um, and those books are Paddle Your Own Canoe, One Man's Fundamentals of Delicious Living, which is similar to his stage show American Ham, if you watched that when it was on Netflix. It's no longer on Netflix and I'm mad about it. But if you've watched that, it's a similar sort of... Cross that show with an autobiography and that's the kind of book it is. It's delightful. Uh, he also wrote Gumption, Relighting the Torch of Freedom with America's Gutsiest Troublemakers. That's really good. Uh, good Clean Fun, Misadventures and Sawdust at Offerman Woodshop, which was really cool because it was sort of a, a profile of the folks working at his woodshop and how cool they are. Because you, you can tell he loves them all so much and he just wants to share his love of woodworking and also the people that he works with um, in his shop just with the world. So it's great. And then um, The Greatest Love Story Ever Told an Oral History by Megan Mullally and Nick Offerman about their relationship and how they got together and that kind of thing. Uh, I've also renewed my library card, which is exciting. Um, I haven't in ages because I'm a compulsive secondhand book buyer and also I like to buy books. Although I have bought fewer books in recent years because it was becoming absurd. It's like as soon as I had the slightest bit of cash to buy books, I went completely bonkers. <laughs> I have a lot of books. Um, and buying digital books doesn't always feel like buying books, so I have a ton of those that I need to read. Um, 
so it just hasn't been a priority because I have so much stuff to read. But um, I was reading about um, the newer things available digitally from with access to your local library on Overdrive and um, an app, like a companion app called Libby. And that includes a ton of audiobooks. So I popped into the library, renewed my library card, um, which is the easiest thing to do if you have a library card. She just verified that my address was still the same and my phone number. And she just put a new expiration date on my library card that I've had since I was probably four years old. Um, <laughs> Once we were old enough to write our names, we got library cards <laughs> because our preschool, our pre-kindergarten, so like ages three and four, um, was right across the street from the library. So, <laughs> renewed my library card and I've been devouring everything I could listen to on the Libby app. Um, I've listened to two different versions of The Fellowship of the Ring. I've listened to the American NPR dramatization and the BBC Radio 4 dramatization, uh, which is especially delightful because Frodo is played by Ian Holm, who plays Bilbo in the movie. Zuh. So, <laughs> so that's a delightful bit of um, serendipity. Is that the word that you would use in this case? Uh, it cheers me to no end. I've also listened to the first volume of the Spiderwick Chronicles as it's narrated by Mark Hamill. Um, and the Spiderwick Chronicles is by Holly Black and Tony DiTerlizzi. Y'all know who wrote Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, and Two, to Two Towers just... I had a hold on Two Towers. So, you know, you have to put on a hold to, to wait in line to borrow the digital thing, which is the only inconvenient part about this. But um, so far, the books that I have put on hold have shown up a lot sooner than the estimated time. So <laughs> that's good. Um, yes, Spiderwork Chronicles, narrated by Mark Hamill, which is delightful because he does great voices for um, folks like already forgotten his name. The brownie in that book. Thimbletack. That's his name. Good job, me. Uh, and I've started listening to The Alchemist by Michael Scott, and that's narrated by Dennis O'Hare, which is a book that I have been meaning to read. It's a young adult book. Um, but I've never gotten around to it. One of my brothers owns that book. Possibly one or two of the sequels. But I never got around to reading it, so I'm gonna listen to it. There's a whole ton, especially, especially a whole ton of young adult and children's books in there. I've put in a hold on the Harry Potter series because I've, I've listened to some of the, the first ones, but I've never actually listened to the full series. Um, they've got the, um, Aragon series. I don't remember who that's by, but it's another fantasy young adult children's series. Um, so yeah, I'm, they have the full series of unfortunate events on there. I'm just gonna nostalgia my way through <laughs> every available children's or young adult books available for audio for a while. Probably cancel my Audible subscription for a bit and save some money. I just love audiobooks. Stuff I'm reading. I'm also reading some physical books. I've read two natural dye related books. I'll just knock my lamp over. It's fine. Um, I got this book secondhand I think from the Barnes & Noble used bookstore area. This is A Garden to Die For by Chris McLaughlin. 
Um, natural dyeing. And then for Christmas, Gabby bought me um, Botanical Color at Your Fingertips by Rebecca Desnos. And she has a natural dyeing book that at some point I'll remember to borrow from her. But natural dyeing is kind of the spare brain space thing that I'm thinking about right now. And you've seen some of that in my previous video, which was an in-between video about some natural dye adventures. And I hope to continue that. I just need to not expect so much from myself because it's a lengthy process. It's not a fast hobby. It's a slow hobby. So, doing some reading there. And one of my goals for 2019, I don't have a ton of goals, not specifically outlined goals anyway. I'll make goals as, goals as I go along, is to finish the rest of these suckers. This is The Last Jedi. This is Return of the Dark Side. This is book number six in the series. And there's 11 of them, I think. I need to finish these. These are written for fourth graders. <laughs> Need to finish them. <sighs> I love Star Wars so much. I don't know why it's so hard for me to just stop and pick these up. But my goal is to finish the rest of them by the end of this year. I can read anything else I want, but I gotta finish these. <laughs> I have so many books. That's going to do it for this podcast. I think I've talked long enough. Uh, show notes and everything will be over at freakishlemon.com. Come join us at the Ravelry group if you'd like. It's not a whole heck of a lot going on right now over there, but, you know, if you want to contribute or you want a thread up to propose a thing, you know, if you got something you want to work on with other folks in the thread, let me know. I don't know if it's open for anybody to start threads or... I don't know. I barely know what I'm doing over there. I'm not spending a whole ton of time learning it, but if you want me to, I will. Um, you can follow me as Freakish Lemon at Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Ravelry, if you'd like. Uh, links to all these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you do want to follow along with these videos, um, consider hitting that subscribe button. It's down there somewhere. Um, and YouTube will let you know. That's going to do it. Yep. Goodbye. <laughs>